do you at this point have any doubts or questions about Burrow as a prospect? Not really. Um, but you never want to say that a prospect is perfect. So he's gotten to the point, or, or I've gotten to the point with him, uh, that I'm trying to nitpick a little bit. I don't think he has an absolute cannon for an arm, but I don't think that will be a problem at the NFL level. I think he has NFL starter quality arm talent. Um, and then just kind of the common or the low-hanging fruit that he only had one season of this elite production. I think he did turn it on a little bit the end of 2018. We saw some glimpses, um, but everything trait-wise, reading coverages, accuracy, uh, drifting inside the pocket while still making plays at times outside the pocket. He really checks all the boxes. Uh, any question at all that Burrow go, goes one, but goes one to Cincinnati? No, I think that's where he'll ultimately go. The one thing I will say um, that maybe can leave a little bit of intrigue for what's going to go down in two weeks is that the Dolphins have 14 picks in this draft they have two first rounders and two second rounders next year so if there was ever a team to offer a massive haul for the number one overall pick and reasonably could pull it off it would be this iteration of the miami dolphins but i think the Bengals, with their new coaching staff zach taylor going into his second season the sean McVay protege i think he wants his guy and everything from the Senior Bowl to the Combine has led to the Bengals being obsessed with picking Joe Burrow at number one. Burrow will be the first pick off the board. Justin Jefferson is likely going to be LSU's next offensive player to go. How much has Jefferson helped himself from the end of the season through right now? You could say, in terms of offensive players, there's not anyone that's helped himself more. I mean, maybe there's a couple late-round guys that have pushed themselves into the third or fourth round. But I think Justin Jefferson was a second, maybe even a third-round pick at the start of this process to run 4-4-3 at the Combine and test as well as he did. Uh, no one really saw it coming. I don't know if he plays to that speed on film, uh, but the contested catches you certainly see. Um, you love the production in 2019. Um, that he does have some wiggle after the catch. And really, my main concern with him was his speed. So he proved me wrong and, and a lot of other draft analysts, and I'm sure a lot of teams, by running that 4-4-3 at the combine. I think Philadelphia Eagles at number 21 overall would make a lot of sense. Uh, he will probably be, like you said, the second LSU offensive player picked in this draft. Uh, Chris Trapasso is with a CBS Sports NFL draft analyst. What are you hearing, and, and what is your thumbnail on Clyde edwards Elair? He's going to go in the second round. That running backs today that are great receivers, and certainly LSU fans saw how reliable of an underneath option he was to not only catch the football but make defenders miss, that's what the NFL is looking for. That after Todd Gurley flames out in Los Angeles with the Rams after signing a big contract, I think the Cowboys – are probably already regretting paying Zeke Elliott. Um, teams are looking for value round two, round three at that running back position, and you have to be able to catch the football. Um, so over 50 catches for Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Insane lateral ability, contact balance. He reminds me a lot of Devin Singletary, who went in the third round from Florida Atlantic to the Bills last year and was one of the best young running backs in the league by the end of the season. Smaller, hard to find, hard to tackle. Uh, I think somewhere in the middle or back portion of round two, that's where we will ultimately see him picked. Chris, what about? I'll get into the offensive linemen. We'll go one at a time with them in a second. But one more skill guy is Thad Moss, who had the best receiving season for a tight end in LSU history and obviously is a legacy. Uh, what does your crystal ball say about Moss? I think early day three for him, fourth or fifth round, um, because you can see on film for as reliable – of his hands, I think the fact that he's not a seam stretcher, he's mostly an underneath guy. Occasionally, like in that Alabama game, you saw him make a few plays down the field, but I think his speed is a real concern. Um, great blocker, which you do not see a lot of those types uh, coming out of the tight end position in the draft. Really gets after it and can move people. That will help him. He can play H-back. Um, so just the fact that he doesn't have that elite athleticism um, could be the only reason why he would fall down because he didn't drop a pass last year. 
and he's a good blocker, um, but he just doesn't give you a ton of value down the field. So fourth or fifth round for Thad Moss if he's fully healthy. Chris Trapasso, he's on Twitter at Chris Trapasso, CBS Sports NFL Draft Analyst. Get to his stuff there at CBSSports.com. Let's move to the offensive line where this kind of gets a little curious, and you could see this this giant gamut, but let's start in the center with Lloyd Cushenberry, who – I, I don't know, Chris. I've heard some say maybe may the best center in this draft. What do you say about Lloyd? Well, I think he's right up there with Cesar Ruiz from Michigan and Matt Hennessy from Temple, and they're all different players. Lloyd Cushenberry in a team that wants to run a lot of power and have a lead blocker and just demolish people one-on-one, they're going to want Lloyd Cushenberry, and they're going to place him higher on their board than Cesar Ruiz or Matt Hennessy that are more lateral agility type of zone scheme centers. I think the fact, and I've written this in my notes about Lloyd Cushenberry, the fact that he was in a pass happy offense and had so many pass set reps um, that you can see what he can do as a pass protector. I think he needs to improve a little bit um, when it comes to dealing with counters or if he needs to slide laterally, but he's another one. I think he'll be the second, maybe the third center off the board somewhere in the second round so you think for sure then that Cush goes in round two um yeah so what wouldn't slip in round three the the interesting one really interesting prospect is Sadiq Charles because Sadiq obviously has a lot of athleticism but he also there's off the field issues there with Sadiq as well what what is the the book at this point heading into the draft on a guy like Charles Well, I think you hit the nail on the head that if you look at him, he looks like Tyron Smith from the Cowboys. He's long, he's chiseled, not a lot of bad weight on his body. And watching his film, you see glimpses of Tyron Smith, and then you also see glimpses that he looks like an undrafted free agent. He's still young, um, was somewhat of a surprise entrant into this draft, but I don't blame any of these LSU guys after that season for going to the league. There will be some teams, like you said, that will have a little bit of a red flag on him for the off-field concerns. But he, with his talent, he's a moldable ball of clay. I think third round for him after some of these top tackles are gone, that's where we'll ultimately see him. He might not start as a rookie, but in 2021, I bet he will be a starting left tackle in the NFL. That's interesting to think about a potential undrafted free agent, but because of the talent and the athleticism, round three is a projection there. Uh, another guy is Damian Lewis, who came to LSU from JUCO, who's got this reputation as a big mauling interior guy. Is is he versatile enough and good enough to be a guy that's going to be selected in this draft? Yeah, oh yeah, I think so. I think third to fourth round, maybe a little later. Um, but I, I've talked to a few people that can see him going on the second day. And it's going to be similar to Lloyd Cushenberry in that the teams, like you said, that want a mauler that's in the phone booth, is going to demolish defensive tackles, they'll like Damian Lewis. If they're going to ask in a zone scheme to have their guards get lateral um, and and get out on screens a whole lot, I don't think Damian Lewis would be on their day two board. But we saw him at the Senior Bowl, he and Cushenberry, in those one-on-one drills that are really tailored for these strong anchoring blockers. They were outstanding. They were the two best blockers there um, in Mobile. So I think that helped him quite a bit. Uh, measured in very well at the combine. I think uh, he will be a, a starter at some point as a rookie because he has the strength and the low center of gravity. Like Cushenberry, though, could get a little bit more refined as a pass protector, but he's an NFL-ready run blocker right now. Chris, do you have a draft grade on any other offensive player from LSU this year? Yeah, Stephen Sullivan. Um, what he did at Mobile at the Senior Bowl to show his speed – and his linear athleticism, along with that gigantic wingspan, he seems like the vintage sixth or seventh round pick that a team will say, okay, we're not going to ask you to do a ton as a rookie, maybe throw you in a couple sub packages. Um, Are you a wide receiver? Are you a tight end? But there's enough athleticism and length there um, that I think he will be selected. I have him graded in the sixth or the seventh round. Wow. That would be one, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine LSU offensive players with a draft grade. Uh, it, it's going to be a record haul for LSU. We haven't even gotten to the yep. defensive side of the ball yet.